apologies for that sort of loud interruption. And let's do introductions. Um, I'm Melissa Connolly from CalSWEC. And I can see that we have um, Lisa McCullough. Did yes. I say your name right? Mm -hmm. Hi. We'll Hi. start introductions with you, and then maybe go to Leslie, then Soledad, and then maybe Elizabeth will be back. OK. I'm Lisa McCulloch. I'm a trainer. Um, I actually am a social worker from the Chadwick Center in San Diego. And I train on CM I've done some training on CMI, too. OK. What region do you train with? Uh, Southern San Diego area, Riverside, Orange Great. County. Great. Um, it's nice to meet you uh, virtually. <laughs> you too. Hope we get to meet in person sometime. We haven't met in person, have we? I I don't know, honestly. I don't think so. I don't think so either. But okay. And, and I have a quick question. I don't know if you've mentioned this already, but is this going to be accessible somehow afterward as well? Um, I can make it accessible to people who want to. I wasn't going to post it because it's kind of a working meeting rather than a presentation. Mm -hmm. um, but I can make it available to people. We had people said who weren't we able would. to be here. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Leslie, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, this is Leslie Zeitler. I am the Curriculum Research and Evaluation Specialist from Bay Area Academy, and also uh, working 25% time for the Central Academy. And formerly of CalSwec. Formerly the Training and Eval Specialist for CalSwec. <laughs> and I may call on your expertise with this curriculum, Leslie, because I know you've done a lot of work on the CMIs and on evaluating the CMIs. Um, I, I did work editing. I was, uh, other people authored the curriculum, but I did my best with editing and, yes, with the evaluation. I'm happy yeah. to. <laughs> Thank you. And Soledad? Hi, I'm Soledad Caldera Gamage, and I am the Curriculum and Evaluation Specialist with the Central Academy, among other things. And Elizabeth Newby, are you back? Elizabeth Newby from CDSS has been on the line too, and she'll be returning shortly. Um, let's see. So the goals for this webinar are to look at the content in the CMIs and um, look at the new learning objectives and see um, how the trainer's experience with the current curriculum can help us inform the development of the new curriculum. And usually the trainer forums have been some uh, uh, process that we've used when we're doing a smaller scale revision. So I'm finding it a little tricky with these Common Core 3.0 trainer forums because there's such a big change to the way the material is going to be presented that it's not just it's not quite as um, simple an equation to get from point A to point B. Um, but we really wanted to have a way to gather um, input and expertise from the trainers, so um, that's what we're trying to do. And we, we've di we've done an in-person uh, trainer forum on this topic, and then we had uh, our first webinar trainer forum where we talked about the assessment curriculum. Um, and what we really uh, ended up doing mostly was going over the learning objectives and just talking about the way we envision the classes will um, be presented. So I think that's probably all we'll be able to get to in this um, uh, webinar. But it's great to have that infusion of information from the field to help us make sure we're on the right track. So it's a very casual um, sort of webinar, and I, uh, you know, interrupt me, ask questions as soon as they come up. Um, it's I'm hoping for interaction and and to hear from you about um, the materials. So, um, oh, I already said this part about. Historically, traditionally, although we haven't been doing trainer forms very long, what we did was talk about trainability and how the content was working in the classroom, how the activities were working, and then content feedback about missing outdated or problematic content, stuff that the trainees seem to always be confused about or stuff that they ask about but isn't included in the curriculum. 
Um, and so we'll try to do some of that today, but really we're, we're focused today on kind of developing the vision for this new um, piece of core because it is going to change quite a bit. Um, this is my uh, picture of um, letting go <laughs> and going with change because um, I'm a little tied to the current core, so I keep trying to um, you know, push myself to think outside the box, think of things differently, and I think that's going to be really um, a, a hurdle with CMIs because it's been so standardized, um, because it has been standardized at the level of delivery, um, and uh, it's been uh, in place for a while without any changes. So um, we really are going to be going about it differently and um, thinking about it very differently, so I just want to sort of set the stage for that. Um, but we're in it together, and it's going to be okay. Uh, but change is hard, I know, so I'm just trying to have a little levity about it. Um, I want to give a little bit of uh, information about Common Core 3.0, and my apologies to Leslie. I know you've heard this and seen this uh, a few different times, but um, for Soledad, I don't know if you've um, heard me talk about this very much, and Lisa, um, we really are making a significant change to the way um, material is presented for Common Core 3.0. And one of the main reasons for that is because we've uh, heard from trainees and we've observed for, and we've heard from trainers and we've observed for ourselves that there's so much content crammed into the topics that we present in Core that people are overwhelmed with the information and they're not able to really leave um, bring things back to transfer um, to their work the concepts that they get or we don't know if they are and they report that they have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. um, if it feels like to them they get so much stuff that they can't remember anything. So we really are trying to narrow our focus to key information that social workers need to have at the beginning of their careers, understanding that uh, ongoing training is required and that as they go through their careers and have ongoing training, it sticks better because they have more experience to uh, align it with. Um, we really wanted to make use of the technology available to us for um, online learning as a key avenue for um, imparting knowledge to trainees. So we really tried to think about taking a lot of the knowledge base uh, informational content and seeing where we could do it online so that classrooms were really focused on activity. Um, the classroom time should include very limited lecture and should um, always be seeking to teach through uh, interaction and activity. And I know um, people have had experience with um, online classes and some people have had positive experience, some people have had negative experience. I want to make sure that we know that we're talking about a wide variety of online classes from our traditional e-learning modules that are kind of PowerPoint based where you read what's on the slide and then take a quiz to more um, interactive approaches that are game based or quiz based. Um, and that the classroom um, activity will really allow uh, the trainees to do um, interaction with each other, interaction with the trainer, testing of their skills in, um, in taking on roles or um, acting things out. Uh, so they get a chance to practice something with the trainer there to give them feedback and with peers there to give them feedback. And they get a chance to reflect on what they did and how they'll do that in the field. So I hope that makes sense. Um, it is. I really want to stress that we're um, that this will really affect CMI a lot because CMI is a pretty lecture-heavy kind of training with all those um, slides and and a lot of looking at slides and talking about different um, injuries, and that's for CMI one. 
Um, CMI2 is a little different. Um, so do you guys have any questions about that part? Not yet. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so this slide is intended to give kind of an overview of the content that we have identified for this assessment block. Common Core 3.0 divides all the um, Common Core content into practice areas, and we're calling them blocks. So there's an engagement block, an assessment block, a service planning block, monitoring and adapting block, and a transition block. And um, within each block, there's content that's designated for online, classroom, and field-based training. Um, in addition to that, there's some content identified as 100 level. That happens at the beginning of the training, of the new worker training. And there's, uh, for each block, there's a day of um, later return to reinforce ideas or uh, provide more advanced information. Um, so for assessment, uh, what I wanted us to do was look at the current content and how that sort of maps over to the proposed uh, classes for the assessment block. And let's see, it's just so you can see where um, all these different things end up. Um, one of the key things that I want to focus on is the fact that we have currently three days of CMI content, and um, we are reducing that. So um, what we're going to end up with is uh, one day of a child mal maltreatment identification skills practice, um, a child maltreatment identification online course that's a prerequisite for the classroom. And then uh, some of the information that's also included in CMIs is going to come in other places as well. Um, we also have a couple of uh, pieces of content for the assessment block that are coming, um, that are going to be newly developed. So yes, mainly this is meant to uh, emphasize two things, that we're taking the current content and kind of putting it in a lot of different places. So we're not going to see a straight uh, revision into a new class that has the same stuff and that there is a decrease in the time we're going to spend on CMI. Um, so that makes our job a little tricky in um, coming up with the learning objectives that we really want to focus on and recognizing that there's a lot to CMI um, and uh, that we know how important it is. So that's our um, juggling act. Do you guys have any questions about this? Um, proposed content for the assessment block and, and how it's uh, coming together from the current content? Okay. So I want to look at the learning objectives for the new CMI modules. So bear with me while I shift screens around and pull up the document. Um, okay, you should be able to see the document on my screen, and I hope it's big enough for you guys to read. Um, this is the assessment identified content, just so you can see it all laid out um, with the times and everything. So what we're talking about today is this child maltreatment identification e-learning module that's 120 minutes, and will be divided into two 60-minute pieces because we're trying to keep um, our e-learning modules um, to 60 minutes or less. Um, and we're going to talk about our child maltreatment identification skills practice day. Um, I want to point out that we have um, identified some topics for that additional class. That's a day-long reinforcement of uh, knowledge and skills from this uh, training area. And that CMI show up there. So one of the things that we've done is uh, identified 
child maltreatment identification with a focus on brain development and neglect as a topic for that um, one day return. Do you guys have any questions about um, what we're going to be talking about today? Okay. Don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, my numbering and um, uh, margins are spacing are a little off on this because we've already uh, reviewed it and changed it in our in-person meeting. So um, let's just go over what we have identified. So this is, these are the learning objectives for the online uh, child maltreatment identification modules. There will be two 60-minute modules. What we're hoping to um, have trainees take away um, is an introduction to the indicators for physical abuse, neglect, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse that they'll use in the classroom day of, of uh, skill practice. Um, and that will be in the first 60-minute module. When I say the first. That will be in one of the 60-minute modules. I don't think we've identified which one would be first. Um, so we're going to take about 60 minutes to introduce and explain and give them uh, some chances to practice uh, with scenarios using these uh, indicators. Um, and I I think that one would actually come second, now that I think about it more clearly. The other 60-minute module is going to introduce the legal basis for identifying abuse and neglect in California, the welfare and institution code sections related to abuse and neglect, um, and the legal basis for identifying sexual abuse and exploitation under California law. So that's our penal code and um, welfare institutions code. Uh, sections. This um, second 60-minute module is also going to give some information about uh, steps to follow in child welfare investigations, so required face-to-face -face contacts, required assessment procedures, and timelines for completing a referral. And then um, that, uh, that module will also um, include content related to this value in terms of making decisions consistent with the legal definitions described in the Penal Code. Um, and there, are, there will obviously be some uh, overlap so that uh, if the trainee first does the one-hour module where they learn about um, the legal basis for, um, for making a finding regarding an abuse or neglect allegation, the required steps of doing a child welfare investigation, then they'll come to the training to talk about the indicators of physical abuse, neglect, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse. And they'll um, start thinking about applying them in different scenarios. Obviously, these um, definitions of what makes for abuse and neglect are also going to bleed over into that module. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you guys see anything missing from these learning objectives? Is there anything that you think um, we should include here that we don't have or that we, um, we have included but we shouldn't include? I'm thinking about the, the ongoing uh, issues regarding use of the penal code definitions. And it seems like maybe the way we have this worded looks like we're only going to be talking about penal code as it relates to sexual abuse and exploitation. But it seems like we should also be talking about penal code as it relates to physical abuse. Do you guys have any objection to that addition? Mm. Well, why don't you just, why can't you just, um, instead of adding one, Melissa, uh -huh. uh, just broaden the D. Okay. The legal basis for identifying child abuse under California law specifically as defined. Isn't that what you're talking about? 
Yeah, I want to highlight the that there are specifics regarding um, sexual abuse that are different, sexual abuse and exploitation Could that you? are different. So maybe if I do it like that, physical yeah, abuse, sexual abuse, abuse, and exploitation, else. does that make sense to people? Yeah. Okay. Well, is A basically also referring to the legal basis under the penal code? I think that A, I love it when questions like that come up and we don't really know for sure what A is referring to. Okay. Because, <laughs> I mean, I, I look at A and I'm thinking like under the penal code when we're talking about the Child Abuse and Neglect Reporting Act, right? Uh-huh. I, I thought that A had more to do with um, the authority to intervene. But it doesn't oh. say that at all. So. No. <laughs> um, so yeah, what is A? <laughs> Leslie, I thought A was more about based on the most recent research, like what what are identifiable indicators of. So that's K one, right? Yeah, and we're talking about K three A. Okay. Yeah, I I was thinking I was thinking Canra with K three A. Okay. That's what it, that's what I thought it was referring to. Okay. So. Well, then we don't really need it, right? Right, but if that's not what it's referring to, then. <laughs> um, I mean, well, everybody might I think, think something that, different. I think that um, if we take it out, we talk about the authority to intervene in another module, where we're talking about um, engagement and the the judicious use of authority and, and that kind of thing. So it seems to me like this would be cleaner and more focused if we just talk about the laws that um, define what is and isn't child abuse, neglect, physical abuse, and exploitation, mm -hmm. and sexual abuse. Does that worry anybody? No, actually, um, it's interesting because as I'm listening to this conversation, one of the trainers that I wouldn't have asked to be here because she doesn't train this, but she has been a specialized trainer on our Gomez B sign. Uh, uh -huh. She had sent me a separate note about, because um, we still do that quite a bit, um, on saying how some of that stuff needed to go in core because really, um, unfortunately, in some um, county, you know, they don't get as much information on the penal code. Yeah. And so... Um, I know it's still an issue with people not really following the penal code and making their determinations. And, and, and I think that would help, at least in the trainings we've done um, regarding that training, I think understanding it would help kind of some of the differences when they go out. Uh -huh. So um, she'll be really happy to see this. Oh, good. Okay. Well, Melissa, but then you probably want to con – oh. Let's go ahead, Lisa, and then Leslie. Is that okay? Yeah. I was just going to say then you'd want to include – neglect in there too, right, and B, the legal basis for identifying child abuse and neglect, child physical abuse and neglect as well, or, I don't know, word it somehow so that everything's in there? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would just list them, um, Melissa. I'll list them and then um, I'll, I'll let Leslie say her um, comment and then we'll talk about whether or not I should list them. But placeholder listing. Um, Leslie? So it's um, first, and this, this goes to the nitpickiness of um, the training will understand. We've tried to stay away from understand. Thank you. Least in general, because um, they're harder to evaluate how somebody understands something. And then the second thing is I would recommend listing the separate um, under K3B um, Listing them separately. I mean, it's it's actually knowing the WNI code is related to knowing the penal code um, for those. So I'm just trying to think of a an easier way to list them, but I don't know that I can think of it right now. <laughs> so, um, but, but Leslie, I think um, we've done a lot of the Gomez Science training. Yeah, and and you know. I think what we take for what we took for granted is that people um, early on knew how to differentiate the two, and and man, folks struggle with that. So, do you think it's worth it to have um, uh, 
have them be separate LOs in here so they understand that they're, they are separate but related? You know, I, what I will, um, I'll sh what I'll give you is a trainer's from the Gomez Vicente viewpoint, okay. and they would say yes, because uh, W and I is what, referred to, what is referred to all the time in practice yeah. mm -hmm. and what is commonly uh, referenced yeah. in all other trainings and in counties, and the penal code is not. Yeah, that's true. And, and so I think to specifically talk about the penal code in these assessments is critical. I'm thinking about something like this, the the role of the penal code and the welfare institutions code in um, child maltreatment identification or something like that. You know, I, I think I think with just your line of as defined by the penal code, Melissa, we'll cover it. Uh huh. Because basically, I mean, we don't need to spend a lot of time on it. They just need to understand that it is defined by the penal code. I really want them to get that they work together, though, right? That the penal code um, does this part of it, and the welfare and institution code does this part. Well, so rather than to expand on the penal code, does it make more sense to sit on A? So you said they'll be able to identify A through J. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the values kind of gets at that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So you guys can live with what we have right here? Yeah, actually, because I wasn't paying attention to that one. Thanks. Is it Lisa? Um, yeah, that was Lisa. Because I was going to say, because otherwise I was going to say put something like that under A, but yeah, it's in the values, unless you want to be more explicit on A. But I, I think that that's fine. Am I leaving something out? Physical abuse, neglect, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, exploitation. Okay. Do you want sexual abuse and exploitation under K1D as well? Just to batch? There you go. Okay. Let me save this. Okay. So now you can picture in your mind these trainees have completed these two e learning modules. Um, they understand the rules. Uh, as the law describes them in terms of um, identifying physical abuse, neglect, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, and exploitation. They understand the Welfare and Institution Code sections A through J and their um, role in, in bringing things to court. Um, they have been uh, introduced to the indicators of physical abuse, neglect, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse, and exploitation as we currently and, and I think the, the indicators may change, but we're thinking about you know, the indicators that we currently have in the content. So the way we have that now, we have a set of indicators that we use for physical abuse. We have a set of indicators that we use for sexual abuse. Um, and Leslie, maybe you can help me with this part. Um, <clears throat> When we talk about the indicators for neglect, yeah. do we really have that? I mean, we have some things about neglect, but they... We don't, and that's been part of the challenge with the CMI-1 curriculum. Yeah. That at the time that it was first drafted, there really wasn't a lot of information, and so that's the hope of having Tania available yeah. to do some further research to see what what research has been done in the interim time and, and um, published on indicators of neglect. Um, okay. Because you do have, uh, not you, but we, I should say, CalSWEC has, or the state of California has, some um, 
indicators of emotional abuse like these, and so I think some indicators of um, neglect as well. But I don't I don't recall us um, using them in the scenarios that we did for the um, we didn't embedded I, evaluation. We did not, and there's a reason for that is because at the time that it was um, released. Uh -huh. Initially, um, there there was very little research that people agreed on. Said these are indicators of neglect. <laughs> well, right, and so for emotional abuse as well, right? Exactly. Okay. Um, so I think that's going to be part of the mandate for the this next version of this curriculum is to really see what's come up in the ensuing years and update yeah. according to research that's available. I don't know that there will be a ton. Right. However, um, anything would be good that I think starting to recognize, because now that there's some, such a focus on child well-being and things like that, where I could see that easily dovetailing with harder to define, since well-being is hard to define, mm -hmm. having other things that are harder to define, such as emotional abuse, which is a well-being right as well as neglect, which is also a well-being issue. If you think about it, there may be more um, information available now. Yeah. So that's all to say the reason that we didn't have any scenarios on neglect was because we were going to pilot something um, with one of the academies, um, but their, all their counties had to agree that it met the definition, their definition of neglect. Right. So that's going to be the challenge in this version. Yeah. We're going to do it. Woohoo! <laughs> and um, so we, I, I guess I'm saying all this to say that we do have um, some research going on to look at these indicators, and um, more will be revealed. Um, but just to be thinking about that. When I'm referring to indicators, these are the things I'm referring to. And these are the ones from CMI2. So these are the sexual abuse indicators. Um, and what I notice in looking at these uh, in the curriculum is that I don't have a lot of um, citations in support of these. Some of them are obvious, you know, um, but uh, just like with the neglect and physical abuse um, and emotional abuse ones, we are doing some research to see if we can find out. Um, so are, are there some additional indicators? Yes, Leslie, go ahead. Well, I was going to say specifically about the physical abuse and sexual abuse indicators, that was subject matter experts coming together in the initial version of these curricula. Yeah. Who agreed on these um, as indicators at that time. Yeah. So it's good that this will be updated to incorporate the latest research. Yeah, they, I mean, they make sense. Yeah. Um, they are um, important factors, yeah. I'm, I'm interested in um, connecting also to the assessment tools and some of the things that the assessment tools um, have for definitions. Um, of some of the key factors like substance abuse and um, um, excessive punishment, physical punishment and stuff like that, and figuring out a way to make sure everything um, is linked together. It's all consistent, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I just I pulled these up just because I was looking at them yesterday, um, trying to think about how we would actually um, convey these in an e-learning module and then um, bring the students to the classroom to go through scenarios um, to have them use them and try them out. So what, what I'll look at now is the learning objectives for that classroom day. And I want you to think about this classroom day as really being activity-based a skills lab. So um, we may, um, what I hope that we will achieve is um, designing a series of um, case scenarios or vignettes that allow um, for 
deeper exploration of the indicators by the way that they're um, formulated. Uh, so instead of having a lecture training where we look at a lot of pictures of um, various injured children, we may have a, a small section where we talk about specific um, injuries that social workers see commonly. Um, but really, we're going to be um, referring, really, we're going to be directing social workers that if there's a physical injury, the, that they work in collaboration with medical personnel to make findings about that. Um, we want to really be highlighting for them uh, when you find out this, this is where you go to get the expert opinion. Um, and through the scenarios, we also want to be able to um, highlight some uh, different cultural practices or, or other issues that might be confusing or create, create dilemmas for social workers. So. Um, through that uh, active uh, skills practice day, we want to be able to um, focus on these six learning objectives. So um, the first one is the trainee will be able to identify physical, emotional, and behavioral characteristics of children who've been maltreated. Um, and that maltreated intends to include neglect, physical abuse, sexual abuse, exploitation. Um, but it's not specific. So I think we're a little worried about how much we're going to be able to do in one day, um, whether we would be able to do three um, scenarios or four. And I'd love to hear back from you guys what you think is realistic. If you're doing... Um, group work and individual work with scenarios so that they have to, um, you can imagine you'd come to class and get a reminder about some of the stuff that was in the online class. Make sure that you had access to tools to support that, um, the use of that knowledge from the online class. Um, then you might do a scenario as a large group led by the trainer where you um, had a physical abuse allegation or a neglect allegation, um, where you read the scenario, try to apply the um, indicators, think about the, um, these physical, emotional, and behavioral characteristics of children who've been maltreated. Um, then you, after going through a scenario with the trainer, you might do table group scenario, and then you might do individual scenarios. Um, so that in the end, the skills that you're practicing are here in S1 and 2. The trainee will be able to identify child maltreatment using a vignette, and the trainee will be able to identify cultural factors that affect child maltreatment identification, including being able to distinguish child maltreatment from cultural factors and recognizing cultural and familiar factors that may impact identification of child sexual abuse. Um, and then throughout that, we'd be conveying these values. The trainee will value using a strength-based model of practice that provides a holistic view of the family as part of the child maltreatment identification process. And um, having these elements in V2 woven in through the scenarios so that the trainee comes away with um, recognizing that it's important to understand the role of poverty, um, the impact of education, community distress, and environmental stressors on a parent's ability to meet the child's needs. So I know this I'm, represents a vast change from what we've done. I'm curious to hear what you guys think about that. Um, I'm feeling like there's a disconnect in terms of looking at this skill as to be recognizing cultural and fam familial factors, factors that may impact identification on ch of child sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's huge. I think that's a huge part of investigating and dealing with child sexual abuse. Yeah. And I'm not sure where they learn that. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good point. Um, so when you go over the indicators for the, uh, the sexual abuse indicators that are part of CMI2, this is separate from that, yes? Yeah. So we need to have then an additional learning objective, it seems like. I'm just looking at the content in the current module. think about, um, do you think that this uh, child rearing standards and child sexual abuse in a cultural context, this part of the current content is, um, you know, honestly, do you find I don't adequate to, to talk about that, that part of it or? Not so much. I don't know how, I, I don't know that that is really getting to I think I think more what we're looking at in that is are the dynamics around child sexual abuse around I mean there's there's the cultural piece but mm -hmm. um what I mean when we talk about culture it's such a bigger thing than some of what this this part of the current content speaks to mm -hmm. you know I think what we're really looking at has more to do with um you know perpetrator dynamics and um, non-offending parent dynamics and right. mm -hmm. you know dynamics of disclosure and you know all of those different kinds of pieces that then impact the whole investigation and, and the ability to kind of assess the information that you're getting. Mm -hmm. I'm making a note. I, I really just want to ditto that. I think that's well said. I mean. Um, and, and Melissa, in this in the section you're referring to now in the current stuff, mm -hmm. um, it's specific. I mean, it's talking about child rearing, rearing standards and child sexual abuse. And then mm -hmm. what she just said about it's it's what it's stating now is much bigger than that. It is. I'm sorry. Bear with me, please. I'm just making some notes. I'm, um, reporting. I think that one of the things that we um, felt like we were not going to be able to do in core for brand new workers, and maybe we're wrong about this, and you you guys can say that. Is um, go uh, is give a comprehensive um, view of all those dynamics in child sexual abuse mm -hmm. um, because it is huge and um, I, I mean it is for somebody just walking in off the street or just coming from MSW school. Uh, I think their capacity to understand it is pretty um, limited because they haven't experienced it and you know and it's one of those things that um I think if you don't have that on the job experience or or you haven't worked with families going through this set of circumstances that it's it's easy to be in denial about mm -hmm. um, so I struggled a lot when we um reduced the time for CMIs to think about how we would adequately cover these aspects of sexual abuse. And, um, you know, one of the things that I thought about a lot has to do with how practice was handled in the county where I practiced when I was a social worker. And it's, it, I'm glad you're on the call, Soledad, because I don't think it's the same everywhere. But, you know, it has to do with really relying on experts to do child sexual abuse um, interviews and investigations, and knowing that um, you might be looking at these initial indicators or hearing these initial disclosures 
and then you hand things off because you don't want to mess it up. You know what I mean? So I think we need to talk about where the where we need to um, how much we need to cover in this 100 level for core in terms of this much broader topic that requires a much greater level of expertise. Yeah, I think so I that's know. a really good point. Yeah, I don't know yeah. what you guys think about that. Yeah, and I think that the current CMI too is is huge and has yeah. way too much in it. Yeah. Um, and and a lot of stuff that the the worker, the new child welfare worker, really doesn't need, and doesn't need going out there. I, so I would I would agree with you 100 um, percent. But I do think they need more than just what you might train mandated reporters on in terms of this is what you look for in, to, in order to make a report. You know, they need. Yeah. So yeah, I think there needs to be kind of an in between in terms of. So maybe sort know. of an introduction to the some some of those dynamics that they might see in terms mm -hmm. of perpetrator dynamics. Mm -hmm. Non-offending parent dynamics and um, reporting, mm -hmm. disclosing. What were you going to say, Soledad? Well, um, actually, can you go back to this to the page with the learning objectives? I was trying to, to find them on my documents, but I, I have to go to too many um, folders. It's easier if you just switch the screen. Yeah. Um, you know, so I agree with what you said. I, I think a couple of comments, Melissa. So you said. One, the goal, or, or I don't remember how you said it, but about doing a comprehensive look, or you know, um, look here at those. At, at how can I put it? I don't know if it has to be so comprehensive here. I think we would be amiss if we're looking at an assessment and child maltreatment identification if somehow we don't include um, something about those cultural dynamics. Um, yeah. What I don't recall, and I was trying to look for it, Melissa, is is there somewhere throughout the remainder of the um, content areas where there's more um, in-depth material on the cultural factors? Um, so there's that bit of content that I had pulled up that is the content that's intended, I think, to talk about culture. The one you and um, the one you Leslie and Lisa, you guys uh, have more familiarity with the current curriculum than I do. So are we, uh, we're talking about, um, I'm thinking of CMI 1. There's a whole section on cultural. Um, you know, but this is specifically about child sexual abuse. Well, and I, go, ahead. go ahead, Lisa. No, what I was just thinking, I mean, there is that section on culture, but I'm thinking of something that's really more outside of just the, more of the familial factors than the cultural right. factors. Yeah, I mean, there's one problem that we've combined cultural and familiar fa familial factors into one thing, mm -hmm. and they may need to be separated. Mm -hmm. And then I think Soledad's question is, what are we saying about cultural factors and child sexual abuse? Unless I didn't understand your question, Soledad. No, yeah, that, 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 that and because... You have it in the line of child sexual abuse, and then you have it on where on the line of S2, and it says including. But on S2, it says to identify cultural factors that affect child maltreatment identification. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that's right there is enough. So, so that you're just you're specifically just highlighting that it also includes that the dynamic of sexual abuse. To me, S2, without even getting to the A, B, and C, is you're identifying cultural factors that affect child maltreatment identification. So that means that with, given that, to me, you have to have some knowledge um, and a skill learning objective to be able to identify cultural factors mm -hmm. of various populations. Mm -hmm. Because I, I get really concerned with this, Melissa, how it plays out in the room, because if that is not a part of the training, or at least referencing a previous content area, then there tends to be a high likelihood of perpetuating stereotypes. Yeah. And if, if the, if the, and, and, and in all fairness to our trainers, if they don't have the time to go over that, um, 
you know, they don't have a whole lot they can do other than to say, no, that's not correct, and then you move forward. But, you know, I think because now we're tying this into assessment, I'm really concerned with that piece of it. Okay. Because this is this is the challenge with how it's rolled out, is that assessment before was was assessment. You're looking at all of those factors, just by, you know, in the assessment piece. And then mm -hmm. when you got to the child maltreatment, you were referring to being able to identify what meets code and and then you know the indicators of just child maltreatment. Because then when you did the assessment afterwards. Well, I think all of these cultural and familial factor learning objectives are carried over from the current CMI. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. And oh, okay. I, I, absolutely, I, I agree with that. But what I'm saying is, but CMI was just about identifying child maltreatment and what constitutes child maltreatment, because in the separate two-day assessment curriculum, all of those other factors came into play, because that's what they were assessing for. But all, the, uh, all these factors came into play in the current child maltreatment identification as well. But correct me if I'm wrong, this is now, um, we're doing, um, on, this, on the screen you had, it's, we're going to have less time for the maltreatment and assessment than we currently have. We actually have, I think we have more time on assessment than we currently have. and less time on CMI as a specific um, subcategory of assessment. So let me talk, let me say a little bit about um, this cultural and familial factors issue and see if this helps at all. It seems like um, we need to have a knowledge, if we're going to have information about the impact of culture on uh, doing child maltreatment identification in the skill area, we need to have somewhere that as a knowledge learning objective. That's one thing. Um, I th I'm not, I'm really hesitant to have the cultural piece taken out of this because I think it really impacts the way child maltreatment is identified. I think it has a huge role in um, how social workers um, look at things that they see in families, if they're thinking about culture or not thinking about culture, it can make a huge difference. Um, I think culture can specifically um, impact physical abuse, neglect, and sexual abuse, but in different ways. Mm -hmm. So I'm struggling with whether or not those things can be all lumped together or if they need a separate learning objective. Melissa, I I don't think we're we're disagreeing. I think I think how how maybe I'm saying it. Um, so I don't know if it's even another learning objective because I've always I've always believed that if you have it in the skill, you're implying that of course the knowledge piece is going to come first. Yeah. Um, but what I don't see it in is that we're talking about a, a one day, right. and so you but you would have to if you're expecting them to do the skill we have to give them the knowledge of the, the familiar factors and the cultural factors right. in order for them to be able to show it as a skill. Right. And, I, and based on that paragraph, it's, that's not going to do it. What paragraph are you referring to? I mean, to? based on the content that's there. So we have to really beef up. The based on the content that's in the current class? Yeah. Yeah. So the content that's in the current class would have to be improved. Yeah, based on what you're saying and what Lisa said. Yes. Yes. So we are agreeing. Yeah. Okay. Not that I want to. I just. I. I'm just. But I guess. Sometimes you have to pull me along. I don't know where you're but, going. But, but I guess, so I guess where I'm on the fence at is I, I'm agreeing that it has to be part of a training. I am concerned that when I keep looking up at my screen and see one day and I look at all of these objectives, mm -hmm. the three skills and the content mm -hmm. of those, I get concerned that realistically that can be done, even with the online. Because mm -hmm. I don't, and now I just don't remember, I don't recall that being part of the online. Let's look. It is not. 
So um, it may be that we want to include something about that to introduce that concept in the online um, so that you kind of remember we're expecting to cover these things in 60 minutes and these things in 60 minutes. Um, so it may be that um, included in the 60-minute module where we cover K1, we could begin, uh, you know, lay the foundation of the role of cultural and familial factors. Um, yeah. But what we really are are trying to do in the day long class is um, construct scenarios that um, can get people to understand the way culture or familial factors can influence their work, impact their work, so that then the trainer has an opportunity to highlight that and focus on it and get them to make the connection in their minds um, of how that is impacting their interactions about the vignette. Melissa, I, I, I don't disagree with you at all. Good. Okay. I think the, the concern I have in how it plays out in the room, though, is, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, and I know even sometimes I, when I'm sitting in a room and I hear things, it's even hard for me to believe it, and I'm in the room, is that, you know, unfortunately, there are still areas and or folks in certain regions that are not exposed. And, and you know, I, I can't say without going over it and then applying it, um, they're going to get that on their own. So, um, but I'm looking at the page you're on now, and I'm looking um, where you have on K2. Mm -hmm. And I recognize the following steps in a child welfare investigation. See, mm -hmm. to me, that's where something needs to be because part of when they're doing a child welfare investigation <laughs> is, is, you know, understanding the cultural context of where they're going to conduct these investigations and with the folks who they're um, assessing. Mm -hmm. Because then you can give it to them in a the practice piece and apply that. But it looks like you're adding that as like a K2. Would that be the, both the cultural context and then also the familial context that you'd be putting as kind of a separate, a second? I'm knowledge? thinking, I'm, yeah, I'm sort of, I put that there to kind of suggest the idea. Right, right. And I, I think that um, cultural context, definitely. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm still struggling with, the separation of familial issues and sexual abuse. I think that's a really important one. I think that it needs to be um, specific and not, what's the word I want to use? Like, it, it shouldn't be too broad or too big, too much, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> too advanced, I, I guess. I know. Be, you know, it can be basic, but I think that I think there's a, probably a way to make it basic and still present it because, you know, I think even for new workers going out on their first sex abuse case, they're going to need to have some of that knowledge going in. I mean, yeah, we definitely want them to be utilizing all the experts and the resources, but they're still the first responders. They're going to have to have you know, some sensitivity to what they're dealing with. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, uh, yeah ab absolutely. I, uh, yeah, you're hitting it right on target. I mean, you know, I always say they don't know what they don't know. Right. And so if, if, you know, they have not been exposed to some of the familiar factors, um, especially in particular regions, um, you know, we have new workers going out to do assessments in regions or in areas that they've never been in. Um, and so if they don't understand that and how, and then I'm going to go back to what you said earlier, Melissa, because um, this is what it comes down to as new workers. They, at a minimum, need to be aware of their, um, what, they, the, what they bring in and their own understanding is going to impact the decisions they're making. Right. If they're not, it, it, it is our responsibility that we hire and or train folks to understand the populations we're going to be working with. 
Right. You know what? That's a whole other piece that's not in here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just the, the workers and their own, what they're bringing to the, how their own, do we have that here somewhere? Um, it's not in the CMIs, but it is in the, a couple of other places. In the okay. foundational um, yeah. classes, there's a lot of, um, talk of content related to identifying bias within yourself and um, within your agency and figuring out what to do with it. Okay, because there's a lot of that in the current CMI too. Yeah, and, a and lot least, of discussion I, about that. I think what's really good is that at least how how I see it played out currently is they get it in the values and then they also get it in the multicultural curriculum. But this is where we can put it into practice. This is where we go back and remember what what you know this class had. This is where it's really going to get down to how does it play out when you're making assessments or how is it going to play out when you're identifying whether this is abuse or not. Mm -hmm. So they have it there, but I think those pieces of, of um, how it, the cultural and familial factors specifically need to be clear. Um, Melissa, I hate to do this, but I'm going to because I think it's important. Okay. Um, some of the same issues we're talking about here on um, the impact on, of identification of abuse on the values, the going to value of understanding of how poverty, lack of education, community distress, and goes on, impair a, a parent's ability to provide for a child's need. Uh huh. Um, I I know it's just the values one, so people don't look at that closely, but I do, and I get concerned because are we covering all that information? Well, we're going to if we have it as a learning objective. <laughs> and and so I don't see how we can add any content on all of that. Uh huh. And and I guess I'm and maybe I should know this already, but. Um, I guess I'm just uh, I'm wondering why this has to be here. Because I think because it's assessment. important. I'm sorry, I interrupted somebody. No, I was just going to say because to me that part of that is part of the whole assessment, a parent's ability, and and that's we're going to go into how the, how it impairs it in the. Mm -hmm. That's what they should be getting out of it. I, I see this real important, like in the case planning curriculum. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, when we do a case planning, we're going to talk about, you know, what they need to do. But I'm a little bit lost and, and concerned about how much this would have to add to curriculum. Well, I think this is just a value that's related to um, using the indicators. But this is something that we put in here. Leslie, if you can um, remember, we put this in here in the day-long trainer forum and we moved it from somewhere else. Okay. And we go ahead. Um well I think I can't remember exactly the context for the move, but I think um I'm gonna guess, at least this is my understanding of looking at that learning objective, is that when we're looking at child maltreatment and and you're considering cultural practices that may have an impact and how a worker identifies whether or not it's actually child maltreatment. But the other piece for workers to remember is that this is not, um, this, there's another context for it that's not just cultural per se. There's another context that affects this family um, where there's probably a higher incidence of child maltreatment when you don't have enough resources or you don't you have a lack of education or there's a, there's community violence going on that there's a context that um the violence I'm thinking of community violence is not necessarily considered cultural but it has a tremendous impact on the family what's going on in the family and the family's coping skills um for whatever the child welfare worker is coming in for so there's like trying to situate um, what I'm seeing as a worker walking into a situation in the context of something much larger that I also have to keep in mind. I think it, for me it's about neglect, really. And I mean, it, it has to do with when you're trying to identify neglect, which we have to talk about. Um, we need to talk about, we need to spend most of our time talking about neglect in this class, really, because that's the thing that workers have to focus on the most when they get into the field. Um, and 
equipping them with a lens to uh, see how poverty, education, the distress of the whole community and other environmental stressors impact the, what they might be seeing as neglect and how that needs to be considered when they're making their um, assessment, when they're making their decision about whether something is neglect or not. I think that's what this is trying to get at. And maybe the way it says impair a parent's ability to provide for the child's needs needs to be reworded. Um, and I think that probably is a result of this coming from a different class mm -hmm. and being put here. Because I think that if we're going to cover neglect, if we're going to cover identifying neglect, we have to talk about this. And it will be in the indicators about so then, neglect. So, so, then it's, so, so I agree with you, Melissa. It's not that it's going to impair a parent's ability, but it's going to be how it contributes to. Yeah. Because I, I get concerned that, well, I mean, I'll, I'll just leave it at that, that it, it is about how it could impact either the risk of or um, impact the likelihood of the, I don't know how you want to word it. Um, this is Leslie. I'm sorry, but my mechanic just called, and somebody's oh. coming to get me to pick up my car, and they're going to close early today, so I've got to run. Okay, thank you, Leslie. I'm going to send you these three skill objectives right here and ask you a question about them. Um, let's see. I'll be able to identify a child by treatment of vignettes. <laughs> Are those skills? Um, That's going to be the question. No. Okay. Well, I mean, in a vignette, yes. Hold on. Um, to S2, no, because it's not a vignette. Uh-huh. Okay. S3, so if I add a vignette. Not a vignette. So S2 and If I add vignette, no. so that will do it for S2 and 3. Yeah, and I might say, um, what do you want for S1? Um, is that similar to the previous S1 for this curriculum, for CMI? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to give a provisional yes for S1. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just, um, but it needs to be in the context of a scenario. They need to actually apply what they've learned and be able to extrapolate, not just identify, but they need to be able to, like identifying child maltreatment from a vignette, that's a good skill one. Okay, well, I'm confused about what you said. Um, I thought you said you wanted me to add something here. Something about um, extrapolating. Two and S3 is given a vignette or something that you add. Yeah. I'll reword. Yeah. I have to think about S2 and S3 a little bit more because it's not as, it's really application of knowledge. Yeah. So I'll email you because right. I don't want to make you late for. Yeah. You're right. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Bye. So let's um, let's talk for a minute um, about going back to the familial factors and the cultural factors. Um, and seeing if we what we need to do about um, S2 and S3, and whether there needs to be a related knowledge objective, keeping in mind that we added uh, we're going to add K2 and K3 here to kind of introduce those context those concepts. And when we come over here to our classroom, um, we're going to. Ask them to identify child maltreatment in a vignette, S1. We're going to ask them to be able to identify cultural factors that affect child maltreatment identification, including distinguishing child maltreatment from cultural factors, um, and recognizing cultural factors that may impact identification of child sexual abuse. And then S3, the trainee will be able to identify familial factors that may impact identification of child sexual abuse. Does that S3 say what we want it to say? 
this is the one that we're trying to get at those dynamics. Right. The dynamics in the child um, sexual abuse investigation that um, can be so confusing and um, misdirecting sometimes. So I'm not sure if that really says that, the thing that I have highlighted. Right. It says familial factors, but I don't think that's really what we need, what we mean. I think we mean... Um, Um, Dynamics, really. Investigation dynamics? Or disclosure dynamics? Dynamics? I know. <laughs> that wasn't very helpful, was it? If um, we <laughs> put dynamics by itself, then we have to say what we mean. Yeah, no, I know. I'm trying Fine. to think of... And I can't just say perpetrator dynamics, even though I kind of know what we mean. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm trying to think of the wording that makes more sense. Um, and you took out the familial? I took out familial, but maybe we need to, maybe it maybe could be familiar one of factors. ABCs. Maybe familiar factors, and then you could put, like, perpetrator dynamics. Oh, I don't know. Identify familial or familial Dynamics that may impact identi identification. Family dynamics? Yeah, that may impact ident identification. I, I really like the way we kind of talked about it a few minutes ago when we were really thinking about it in terms of some of the things that perpetrators do that interfere with investigation and identification of sexual abuse, some mm -hmm. of the things that non-offending parents do mm -hmm. that can really put um, stumbling blocks in the way of identifying the abuse, mm -hmm. and some of the things that the victims disclose and don't disclose and how they can um, go back and forth about what they're disclosing, and that doesn't mean that it did happen, it doesn't mean that it didn't happen, and, you know. Right. So, um, Melissa, and I think you, you wanted to put, be able to identify family dynamics. Uh-huh. Um, on the actual S3, and then? The whole thing about um, minimizing. But, because, see, for me to try to think about how I'm looking at it, I'm trying to think of the actual... Um, either vignette or actual scenario that we would use and, and then some of the issues that come with it. Mm -hmm. so I guess I want to make sure that we're like on the same page if that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, so, so like here we're talking, I'm thinking about that clip that we use. You know, like for instance, if you have somebody who is using a family member to care for the children mm -hmm. because they're, you know, don't have the funds to go, you know, they, they use somebody living in the home, or, they, or families who have multiple family members living in their home, adults. Mm -hmm. um, right. It, that confuses matter because then there's a fear of what happens. Right. Um, is that, am I on the right, at least, area of what we're talking about? Perpetrators take advantage of that, they're able to use that, um, mm -hmm. or kids need. Um, um, more need for attention? Well, I'm, I want to ask Lisa to, because, you know, I think what I'm thinking about when we say all this, because I don't train this, is I'm just thinking about specific cases that I had as a right. supervisor and thinking about ways that perpetrators confuse the issue or discredit mm -hmm. people. Um, yeah, and the, the thing I'm... Sorry. No, no, I interrupted you. Go ahead. I'm just, and the way that, like, what Soledad is saying, the way different um, circumstances within the family, um, who's who's the head of the family, who's the respected person in the family, you know, who's um, everybody's least favorite in the family and how that can affect the way things get interpreted, all of that. Um, and so that 
but I'm wondering if you were maybe thinking about something a little more specific when you were talking about this. Actually, no. And I was thinking about something broader even, because what I'm worried about is if we get too specific here, then we yeah. you know, leave out too much. Yeah, I think that yeah, we, limit um, it. we limit it, exactly. And I think that it is all those things. Mm -hmm. So being able to talk about it in a, in a more broad way, because there are so many different aspects mm -hmm. um, that I think being able to talk about disclosure in general and, you know, all the different things that can impact that and talk about, you know, perpetrator kind of dynamics and, um, you know, family dynamics and, and some of those things in a more in a broader sense rather than bring it in very specifically to certain situations and if we're using vignettes then we can probably um illustrate some of those things and then be able to you know expand on them mm -hmm. um so i don't even i don't even know if we want to list the things necessarily or if we want to mm -hmm. just say identify um Family dynamics or dynamics of, I'm trying to think like sexual abuse dynamics, really. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. That may impact investigation of child sexual abuse. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I, I, I'm still, the wording still isn't really working though, is it? Mm -mm. <laughs> so, um, so you're talking about sexual abuse dynamics that, or dynamics that you see in sexual abuse cases but don't mm -hmm. necessarily constitute sexual abuse. Um, so it's a way of hiding it because they have, um, perpetrators have a tendency to be able to, um, I guess, cover their, what they're doing. And I didn't put that right. No, I think I know what you're saying, and, and I think that um, that's part of it for sure. And, and that... And there's two, and I guess for me, Melissa, this is the only reason why I'm so vocal and I'm struggling with it, is because on one hand, we have a group of people that we have to make really sure that they understand, um, and, and I agree with you, so that, you know, the broader concepts, just to be aware that this is something they've got to be aware of when they're going out and doing this. On the other hand, we also have workers who come in and want to save all the children, and we, we want them to be able to conduct a thorough assessment and be aware that although those are dynamics that impact and can, can um, impede your investigation, it doesn't, you know, so I'm just thinking of um, some of the scenarios we use, but, you know, in other words, it, it you know, I'm thinking of, of uh, in homes where they're not used to having um, men stay home and be the caretaker of young girls. Right. Um, and or um, multiple families living in the home and sharing a bed. You know, that that's not constitute um, an abuse. Yet, mm -hmm. but we know perpetrators actually use those certain dynamics in order to get away with what they're doing. Right. Because they're easy targets. Yes. I don't know how to put it. In how do you way. say that in a learning objective? <laughs> saying, yeah. I don't know how to put that in the language you want. But, you know, but, but I agree. Um, it's just understanding that whole process in investigations that people have to be aware of because we don't want them to exclude anything, but we right. want them to be very much aware of that. Yes. I don't know how to word it. I just want to <laughs> the idea or the thought, and then you're supposed to put that. I don't, know. Uh, I don't know. Um. I and the other concern I have is that we're at the end of our time. Uh, so yeah. I'm going to work on the wording. Yeah. Um, and Lisa, and now I'm thinking the other way around. Address. Oh, okay. Well, and just to add, you know, now I'm thinking the other way around, maybe having those three under there would make sense. So play with that some more, too. Having the okay. perpetrator dynamics and the disclosure and the non-offending, because maybe that does work. 
uh-huh. to give it more, bo- you know, more clarity. So I don't know. But anyway, yeah, my email address? Yeah. It's L McCulloch, M-C-C-U-L-L-O-C-H, uh-huh. at R-C-H-S-D. R-C-H-S-D. Dot org. Okay, great. Um, because I'm going to try to um, get you guys to help me with working on this wording. Okay. Because and, you know, the, the other person who really wanted to be here and couldn't today is Lori Fortin. Okay. And she's obviously really involved, well, I don't know if you know, really involved with this and has done a lot of training on the CMI, too. Uh-huh. Um, oh, and, and, I, think and we, I used her for specialized training, and she's just really awesome. Yeah. So, I'll loop um, her in, then. Yeah, so she was asking me to find out if I can, if there's any way to watch this after the fact. So I can fill her in on what we talked about. I don't know if she needs to actually watch it again or if she can just right. you know, be involved from here on out. But okay, great. Yeah, I'll send the link anyway, and if somebody wants to watch this. Perfect. Okay, <laughs> I will let her know. Excellent. Okay, thank you guys. I really appreciate your help, and we um, are making a lot of progress on getting these to where they need to be. So thank you for taking the time to work on this with us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for oh, you're welcome. Work thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. All righty. Bye-bye. Thank you. Please stand by.